We've had Cycles X for a while now, and although it's been a major improvement over the old Cycles, you'll still run into slow and sluggish renders sometimes. In this video, I'll give you 5 tips to improve render times in Cycles, so let's get started and let's get into it. Now for this project, I have created a standardized scene, which should be pretty similar to many of you guys' project. It contains well over 700,000 verts and also has some high fidelity nature assets containing high res textures and displacement and things like that. All render settings are currently similar to the Cycles factory settings. So nothing has been changed and let's get started on improving that. Tip number one, render device. Now this tip might seem like a bit of a duh moment. However, I'm just gonna put it out there. Sometimes people don't know this. So by default, Blender uses a CPU in cycles. Now a CPU has a big advantage and that is that it doesn't crash no matter how long it takes to render out a single frame. But it can literally take ages for a single frame to render though. For example, this specific scene when I rendered it out in a CPU, it took well over two hours and that is with a pretty, pretty fast CPU. Uh, not a great number there. Instead, what we want to use is a GPU or a graphics processing unit. This is a specialized piece of hardware, which can really crunch out a lot of numbers at the same time to get the fastest result for rendering. So let's change that right now. So in here, in the render properties, you'll notice one thing, device is currently set to CPU. Let's click here and change that to GPU compute. Now this might be grayed out for you. And if it is, that basically means that either you don't have a GPU enabled in Blender, or you have an incompatible GPU. If we go over to edit and to preferences in system, you will currently see what type of cycles render device you are using. Now I am using optics, which is compatible with my RDX 3070, but you might be using CUDA, which is the older architecture and compatible with older types of graphics cards. It could also be set to none indicating that you currently do not have a compatible GPU. And it could also be set to hip if it is an AMD graphics card that you are using. Optics works best for my setup. Everything, like I said, is completely default in these settings. And we are going to use this as the base benchmark, just using a GPU render of this scene. Let's render it out and see how long it takes. All right, so it finished and it uh, it only took, and I mean only took, six minutes, 49 seconds, and 51 hundredths of a second to render out a single frame. So imagine rendering out 300 frames for an animation. Uh, I mean, it would take days. However, we can do so much to improve on this. And that actually brings me to tip number two, noise threshold. Usually when you hear me go on about render settings and stuff, I'll talk about samples. So the samples are the amount of samples that Blender renders before it finishes a render. Now by default in cycles, these are set to 4,096. It's a pretty, pretty high number. And usually what I say, okay, go down to something like 150 or 300, you know. Actually, I found out I was being a bit of a noob and there's way easier ways of doing this. And that's by using the noise threshold. Now by default, this is set to zero. 0.01 and by default it is enabled. What this does is Blender will constantly look at the render and determine the amount of noise in the scene. Once this noise crosses the threshold, Blender will finish the render and start denoising it. Now by default, the 0.01 will usually mean that it needs to finish up all the samples. However, we can increase this threshold by quite a bit and just letting Blender determine, okay, unless we are below this threshold, I won't finish the render. I will just keep on crunching samples. So that's way better than actually saying just use 300. Instead, let's just let Blender Blender do the magic like it always does and let it determine for itself. So I'm going to set the noise threshold to 0.1. I'm going to re-render and let's check the difference. All right, so it finished in exactly 36 seconds. So this setting alone has been such a major improvement, basically the same as limiting the amount of samples, but I think it went up to well over 1800 samples. Important to note though, is that whenever you start increasing the noise threshold, you will decrease the quality of the image. Luckily, Blender has a pretty good denoiser these days, so it'll usually fill in the gaps and give you basically the same result as before. I will show you the before and after. So this is the original image. And this is the one with the higher noise threshold. Now, if it were up to me, I'd say these are exactly the same images. And I just saved well over six minutes of render time per frame. But I'll let you be the judge of that. Now, we can take this one step further, though. And I'm going to set the noise threshold to 0.5. Now, let's see how fast we can render out now. And it decreased the render time down to 17 seconds and 4400 of a second. So again, a major improvement versus using the 0.1 noise threshold. Also, it did decrease 
increase the look of the overall image, but I still feel like it looks basically the same. Again, I'll let you be the judge of that. So here's the previous image with the noise threshold of 0.1, and here's the new image with the noise threshold of 0.5. So with our GPU setup and a noise threshold of 0.5, we are now going to tip number three, light paths. Down here, we have this tab called light path. And in here, we'll see a total of 12 light paths. So these are max bounces, which you can effectively call ray tracing in Blender, but it has 12 total bounces. What I usually recommend doing is setting all of these to one and then start ranking these up depending on your scene. Now, this is a scene containing nature assets. So we'll need a bit of transmission for the subsurface scattering, as well as transparency for or the leaves up here, which all contain transparent images. So I'm gonna set the transparent to two and the transmission to two. And while we're at it, we can also determine if our scene requires caustics. Now, since this is a nature scene without any caustic elements in them, I can just disable reflective and refractive caustics. This will also save some time. Let's re-render our frame and compare after. This did change a little bit again, not as much as before. It took the render time down to 16 seconds and 20 hundredth of a second. As always, please compare the images. So this is the previous image and this is the new image and determine if this gain or decrease, I guess, in render time is worth the change in how it looks. On to tip number four, performance. Whenever we render out a scene, you might have noticed that in the upper left corner, you'll see things like BVH coming along, which needs to calculate stuff like all the textures being loaded in. These are major time sinks for renders. If we go back into Blender here and we go down to performance in the render settings, we can change several things. So by default in the acceleration structure tab, the use curves BVH and use compact BVH are enabled. If we hover over the use curves BVH, Blender will say use special type BVH optimized for curves uses more RAM but renders faster so that sounds like a pretty good thing to me depending on how much RAM you've got I've got 32 gigs of RAM so that's plenty to enable these types of features if you have less RAM then it might be necessary for you to take the hit in render time. Then we have the compact BVH. This one says use compact BVH structure uses less RAM, but renders slower. Now, again, I've got plenty of RAM, so I'm just going to disable the compact BVH and save on a bunch of time. Then next we'll have this final render persistent data. And what this does is basically tell Blender, please store data like textures, which it needs to calculate per frame in a persistent data storage and don't render them each and every time. Time. This is perfect when you are rendering still images or when you have an animation in which all elements are not animated. So for instance, when you have like a camera panning through a room for an ArchFizz simulation and stuff, you could use persistent data and it will save you a bunch of time because it doesn't need to load in these textures every time. Now, if I re-render this frame the first time, it will be the same actually because it still needs to calculate all these persistent data images. The time after it will be significantly faster and I'll show you the second version. All right, so using the persistent data and disabling the compact BVH took the overall render time down to 12 seconds and fifth of a hundredth of a second, a major, major time increase over uh, previous settings. Again, please note that this is only something you should do for still images or for very basic animations without any moving objects. If you have any of the fancy stuff going on, please do not use persistent data. Tip number five, world settings. I have currently been using Nishita Sky Texture for all of these renders, which doesn't take much render time to get in there. However, you might be using an HDRI, which is pretty common for these types of scenes. So let me re-render the image using an HDRI. All right, so after rendering the image with an HDRI instead of a sky texture, it took the render time back up to 13 seconds and 31 hundredth of a second. So that's a slight time increase. So over here in the world settings, instead of the render settings, let's go over to the world settings. You'll have this tab called settings and in here you have this surface sampling option now it's currently set to auto we can actually change this to manual which will let us determine the map resolution now if you hover over it what this is is the importance map size resolution so every time a hdri is calculated blender calculates this importance map basically determining where light should be for the least amount of fireflies within the render and it uses a resolution for that so Higher values, like it says over here, higher values potentially produce less noise, but at the cost of memory and speed and lower values produce 
more noise, but also increase the speed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this to 512. And this is not a guaranteed win, however, but it can decrease your overall render time per frame. So let's see how this pans out. Okay, so in this case, it did not seem to have actually decreased the render time and actually went back up in this case, 16 seconds and 96 hundredth of a second. That's actually quite a big increase again of three seconds. It could really affect the render time. So it's good to know that these settings are there. Those are the five main settings, but I have one more bonus tip for you. And that's again in the light paths. So let's go back into Blender and let's change this final setting to decrease the render time. Now I'm gonna disable the environment first of all. So we are back to the uh, original settings here. All right, so over here again in the render properties, we can go back to light paths here. And you might've noticed it the previous time we were here, but there's this function called fast GI approximation. Now what this does is it approximates diffuse indirect light with background tinted ambient occlusion. This will change the overall look of your image, but again comes with an increase or I should say decrease in render time. So this might be worth it for your specific project. I'm just going to enable it and show you the difference in render time. Okay, so with the FGI, so the fast GI approximation enabled, it took down the render time for one more second. So in this case, we ended up with a final render time of 11 seconds and 17 hundredth of a second. So we started off using only the GPU and all default settings, giving us a render time for this single frame that you are seeing right here of six minutes, 49 seconds and 51 hundredth of a second. And after changing all of these settings, we ended up with a final render time per frame of 11 seconds and 17 hundredth of a second. So that's 4% of the original render time. And that's insane gains, or I should say losses, I suppose. These settings are definitely worth tweaking, but you should always remember to tweak them specifically to your project. So you will still get the result that you are looking for. I've got a summary of all the images that I'm going to put up on the screen right now. So you can see the difference and up left, we'll start with the first image. So this is the highest resolution down at the right. We see the final image, which is the fastest render. This gives you a nice overview to determine which type of image works for you and which settings you should apply. And with that out of the way, these are my final thoughts on this subject. Of course, the best way to decrease render times is to get better hardware. I use an RDX 3070 myself, 32 gigs of RAM and a 3700X Ryzen processor. It's some pretty beefy hardware, but also comes with a steep price. So if you can't get your hands or you can't afford these types of uh, hardware, these settings will help you out dramatically to still increase or decrease, I keep saying that, your render time and make it way faster for you. Important to note though, is that hardware does not make you a better artist. It helps you speed things up, it helps you save time, and helps you iterate faster in your project, allowing you to learn a little bit faster. But in the end, experience and practice are what define and make you as an artist. Luckily, I have over 40 other videos which can help you learn and practice Blender. Check out this one, for example. Also, please consider becoming a patron. Click over here. It really helps support the channel and it'll get you access to 40 other project files and assets that I have created. I want to thank you for watching and see you in the next one. This video was made possible by the following patrons. Thank you so much for your support.